We've all been there. You're 15, sitting in English class and picking out a fresh pimple, when your centuries-old English teacher careens into the classroom steering a dusty, 400-pound TV VCR combo card from some bygone era. While she struggles to put on Zeffirelli's 1968 adaptation of Romeo and Juliet, experiencing a myriad of predictable issues that even your boomer parents have the techno-literacy to decipher, the class lets out a collective groan. Well, at least now I don't have to read the book. Cody whispers from two rows back. He's right. You'll be sparknoting it later. But for now, your class will have to sit through hours of dubbed crying and hoity-toity dialogue, barely registering a syllable of William's signature iambic pentameter as you distractedly whisper to your friends and take extra-long bathroom breaks. For teens, Shakespeare was, and may likely always be, a drag. But why is this the case? Why is Shakespeare so notoriously boring? Is it possible that today's youth have simply aged out of the bard? Well, not entirely. A pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventured piteous overthrows doth with their death bury their parents' strife. The fearful passage of their death-marked love and the continuance of their parents' rage, which but their children's end naught could remove, is now the two hours traffic of our stage. For years, we've come to associate Shakespeare with what scholars like to call high culture, those objects and works associated with the upper classes, things society has deemed to have aesthetic value. Works of high culture belong to this category for the reason that they're inaccessible to the masses. But the thing is, Shakespeare didn't originally exist in the high culture category. In fact, the concept itself is a fairly new one in the realm of modernity. Since Shakespeare's death, his plays have undergone a process of cultural elevation. During his time, the live performances of Shakespeare's plays were produced for audiences of all classes. The Globe Theatre, home to his own acting troupe, consisted of gallery seats reserved for the educated genteel folk, as well as a section called The Pit, reserved for the rowdy masses, or groundlings as they called them, who would pay a penny each to stand and watch their favorite plays. The floor in this area was often covered with hay to trap the smells as drunken guests would urinate openly as they heckled the performers and laughed at fart jokes. If that gives you any indication of the ambiance down there. This intermingled space for high and low classes can largely be attributed to Queen Elizabeth I's lifelong patronage of the arts and her desire to bring entertainment to all of her subjects. It wasn't until 1623, seven years after Shakespeare's death, that his works were elevated to a more esteemed and arguably less accessible status. This was the year that his works were amalgamated and published into a collected edition called the First Folio. This collected works, bound in expensive calfskin material, cost one pound each, which was a small fortune at the time, putting it within the reach of only the wealthiest of people. Thus, according to Douglas Lanier, the conversion of Shakespeare's performative text to literary print removed Shakespeare from a social space where immediate, irrational, bodily pleasures, political and social fractiousness held sway. Now he could be engaged rationally and dispassionately, experienced within a domestic space. It allowed Shakespeare to be separated from association with the unruly elements of popular culture. Into the Victorian era, Shakespeare's works were considered to be lessons in virtue, teaching young people how to become more literate and educate themselves in the ways of Victorian social mores. Even the theatre, which was once a common ground for all of society, had now become a place for passive, respectful spectatorship, where conduct was heavily regulated to the polite decorum of the genteel classes. The measure done, I'll watch her place of stand, and touching hers make blessed my rude end. Now, we've been adapting Shakespeare's works for the big screen since the inception of cinema, with the earliest known example being an 1899 silent film version of King John. But while these adaptions were widely produced during the first half of the 20th century, they were often bogged down by their mission of staying true to the text, 
making them appear more like plays rather than fully realized products of their medium. Especially when applied in educational environments today, these films can often feel stuffy and restrictive, encompassing all the calculated elements of high culture Shakespeare without any of the ephemerality, vulgarity, or uninhibited fun of live Elizabethan era performances. And film adaptations would remain this way, with a few exceptions, until the latter half of the century, an era in arts and literature that scholars would refer to as postmodernism. No one can really agree about when postmodernism began, when it ended, or if it should be called postmodernism at all, but the long and short of it is that postmodernism is. Let me see. Uh, it's a reaction against the ideas and values of modernism, the previous period which upheld the virtues of universal truth, idealism, and reason. And postmodernism met them instead with an emphasis on irony, skepticism, and subjectivity. Much of postmodernist theory is concerned with the effects of late capitalism, how hyperconsumerism and mass media have turned everything into signs and symbols, fragments of their former wholes, and most importantly, how this collapsed the boundaries between high and low culture. What postmodern art produces is tongue-in-cheek, self-aware, disjointed, and pastiche, meaning it replicates older well-known works and ironically distorts them. While it's often difficult to locate a postmodern work because of its broad and frequently disagreed upon definition, the changes that this movement made to Shakespeare on film are actually super clear. Now, for the scope and purposes of this video and the fact that there are 420 Shakespeare adaptations in total, I'm only going to be focusing on adaptations from the mid-90s to the early 2000s. This is because, I argue, the first film to fully usher Shakespeare into the postmodern age is none other than Baz Luhrmann's 1996 adaptation, Romeo Plus Juliet. When maids lie on their backs, that presses them and learns them first to bear, making them women of good courage! Get this shame! While Franco Zeffirelli and Kenneth Branagh dominated the 1960s and 80s respectively with their authentic retellings of Shakespeare plays, often set believably in the Elizabethan time or another era of the distant past, this style became less profitable as we entered the postmodern period. A combination of cultural moods, artistic movements, and a proliferation of media led us to the exact moment where Baz Luhrmann, camp extraordinaire, was able to create the most bizarre, decontextualized, kitschy adaptation put to screen. Now, I'm not gonna lie. As a former thespian and diehard fan of the Zeffirelli version, I used to hate this movie. But as time moves on, I've had to come to terms with the fact that this, and this is probably the most pretentious thing I will ever say, on camera, is a postmodern masterpiece. You have Leo with his Hawaiian Prada shirt, the Verona Beach setting, gaudy religious iconography, MTV pop songs, elements of drag culture, campy acting, and absolutely cuckoo bananas editing. Lerman also inserts pieces of Shakespeare's text all over the place, in signage, in advertisements, in newspapers, on buses. It's a postmodernist wet dream. Perhaps the greatest lover of this movie was Lerman himself, saying, We have not shied away from clashing low comedy with high tragedy, which is the style of the play, for it's the low comedy that allows you to embrace the very high emotions of the tragedy. In other words, Romeo plus Juliet is a stark blend of high and low culture. The language of the text is preserved with some helpful alterations. In my heart love till now, for swear at sight. For I never saw true beauty till this night. And we see self-aware elements of Elizabethan sensibilities. Leo in his knight's costume, the ornate architecture of the Capulet mansion, but it's seamlessly fused with lowbrow humor and nods to the 90s punk scene. And as you would expect, many critics hated it. Gary Crowdis said Lerman was more concerned about concocting a visual style that will pander to the tastes of young moviegoers thus reaching the artistic level of a good high school presentation. My king, Roger Ebert, called the film one grand but doomed gesture that will a dismay any lover of Shakespeare and b bore anyone lured into the theater by promise of gang wars, MTV style. Even Franco Zeffirelli, who directed the prevailing 1968 traditional adaptation of Romeo and Juliet with Olivia Hussey and Leonard Whiting, hated Lerman's interpretation. He said, 
The Lerman film didn't update the play, it just made a big joke out of it. But apparently, the pseudo-culture of young people today wouldn't have digested the play unless you dressed it up that way, with all those fun and games. But you know, he might actually be onto something here. If postmodernism made high culture and low culture indistinguishable from one another, what do we have left to look down upon? And there it is. Young people. Youth culture is the new low culture. Since around the 50s, marketeers have known that young people are the most important consumers. If you can get to the youth, you can shape popular opinion and therefore drive sales. And filmmakers of the 90s saw the direction that people like Lerman were taking, despite the critical performance of their films, and said, you know, there could be an opportunity here. And thus, the gates were opened on a tidal wave of low-culture Shakespeare adaptations in the late 90s and early 2000s. Now, Shakespeare was fully immersed in pop culture, to the point where his works are almost unrecognizable to the untrained eye. This late 90s, early 2000s boom resulted in two types of films, the first being melodramas that were obvious modernized renditions of Shakespeare's great tragedies. We had O, oh, a 2001 version of Othello starring Mackay Pfeiffer as Odin James, a star basketball player and only black student at a prestigious private school. There was Hamlet in 2000, starring Ethan Hawke in the titular role and heir to the Denmark Corporation. And Romeo Must Die, a Jet Li action movie also released in 2000 and starring teen pop idol Aaliyah. The latter two being so incredibly Y2K that it's kind of hard not to laugh at their outdated sincerity. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing, end them, to die, to sleep, no more. On the other side of this were youth culture adaptations of Shakespeare's comedies, or what I like to call Shakespeare, the high school years. These ones you're probably more familiar with. In 1999, we got Get Over It, a Miramax-produced high school musical take on A Midsummer's Night Dream starring Kirsten Dunst and a whole slew of other big names. Never Been Kissed, a Drew Barrymore vehicle very, very loosely based on As You Like It, and Ten Things I Hate About You, a high school version of Taming of the Shrew, starring Julia Stiles in her third contemporary Shakespeare film, and perhaps the most well-known of the three. Joining these a few years later was She's the Man in 2005, based on Twelfth Night, and quite possibly Amanda Bynes' best work. Hey! Hey! What up? Now, these weren't like Romeo plus Juliet at all, in that they completely abandoned Shakespeare's text and even many of the plot elements to fully submerge us in a contemporary experience. What we're left with is the scaffolding of a Shakespeare play. The costumes and script are contemporized, with brief moments of Shakespearean dialogue integrated quite seamlessly. What group is she in? The don't even think about it group? Bianca Stratford, she's a soft. I burn, I pine, I perish. Of course you do. These movies are also less stylized than Romeo plus Juliet, framed instead in the likeness of a John Hughes movie, following teens as they navigate the absurdity of high school and fall into fickle romances. And hey, this formula worked. While these films may not have had critical success, with critics calling She's the Man a comedy that lacks both the verbal sophistication of its source and the sexual sophistication of its target audience, or one overwhelmingly sarcastic review of Get Over It saying, Shakespeare probably made the point best. Teens rule, parents drool. Critics actually kind of proved our disdain for low culture, despite whatever advancements were made by postmodernism. For many critics, the only way a film could be delightfully Shakespearean in the late 20th and early 20th century, it had to be completely venerative of his works, like a Kenneth Branagh film, or at least carefully toe the line between veneration and irreverence. As Emma French puts it, the contained subversion of Hollywood's irreverence, lighthearted, and postmodern film Shakespeare adaptations serves to perpetuate Shakespeare's role as universal educator and timeless, high culture symbol. Small instances of irreverence may reinforce the audience's desire for an authentic text, a sacred original capable of imparting timeless knowledge in spite of what modern adaptations do to the text. But when it comes down to it, which of these films has lasted in our collective memory? 
I can honestly say that while I appreciate the artistry and jubilation of Much Ado About Nothing, 10 Things I Hate About You will forever have a close place in my heart. As Robert L. York astutely points out, audience and critical misconceptions abound regarding a preconceived notion that production should be historically correct, actually a 19th century convention, while Shakespeare's own audience would have been exposed to costumes of their own period, not of the play's setting. It goes to show that while critics, select audiences, and theater snobs like my former self reserve Shakespeare to his high culture status, we can't deny that film as a medium, much like original Elizabethan theater, is meant to be consumed by the masses. As postmodernism taught us, it's impossible to escape pop culture, and we shouldn't necessarily want to. Young people will continue to study Shakespeare's text in school, continue to bemoan it while reading spark notes in the wee hours of the night, but they'll also never stop watching She's the Man. They'll continue to weep as Kat delivers her poem in 10 Things I Hate About You and repost images of Leo on Tumblr. His language can be difficult to decipher in a contemporary moment. But if you take the language away, you realize Shakespeare's teachings are universal, existing outside of time and space, and can be pretty relatable for young people. We can all resonate at some time or another with Tamara's blinding grief or Hamlet's existential crisis. But beyond that, the endless yearning of Viola in Twelfth Night, or Hal's failure to live up to his father's expectations in Henry IV, or the absurd naivete of Romeo and Juliet's romance, are particularly resonant with teens. Remember, his plays were written at a time when kids, as a group, ostensibly didn't have rights. When the idea of a teenager wasn't even a figment of the imagination. And even then, as Stephen Marsh writes, Shakespeare described the terrifying beauty of the adolescent so early in its development, and so definitively and so thoroughly, that it's only slightly an exaggeration to say that he invented teenagers as we know them today. As kids would say it, Shakespeare was the blueprint, and that's why we continue to study his works and all of their iterations in Western curriculum. But most importantly, Shakespeare was never meant to be high culture. His works were meant to provide audiences with a much-deserved escape while also asking them to join him in ruminating about life's great question. As of now, these youth pop culture renditions have slowly died out, and more self-serious, albeit magnificent epics have risen in their place. But while no one is denying the beauty and strength of these newer films, I can't help but reminisce on the teen era. It taught us that Shakespeare is for everyone, and I'm excited to see what the next round of pop culture renditions will bring us. to one.